That looks good. Okay. Welcome to Sorta Like This. Today I'll be breaking down this planetary space traffic hologram I made in Cinema 4D in Redshift. We are going to go over this scene and explore the materials, animation, modeling, and lighting used to create this sci-fi hologram. Let's go break it down. Before we get started, I thought a quick introduction would be in order. I'm Jordan, a hobbyist 3D artist and a professional photographer, videographer, and video editor. In my professional career, I concentrate mostly in product, advertisement, corporate, and real estate, but I also shoot other genres like landscape, abstract, food, and macro on the side. I've been doing this professionally since about 2012 and as a hobby since around 2006. With that said, I've been creating 3D pieces for a few years now and learning even longer, so I do think I know what I'm talking about, at least just a little bit. I started experimenting in 3D since about the time Cinema 4D R17 came out, and that was a long time ago at this point. Because of my professional background, I do tend to do more product style 3D pieces, but I also create more stylized motion graphics pieces as well. They all tend to lean a little more photoreal than overly stylized though. Mostly, I do tend to have simulation elements in them. I really enjoy playing with fluid sims, but I enjoy most aspects of 3D work and try to learn and do as much as I can. I thought that if I'm gonna sit here and spend a ton of time creating work already, I might as well document the process and share it. The goal of this channel is to share some skills and knowledge I do have, as well as document my progress with 3D work. I hope that it would be helpful to someone, maybe give them inspiration, but at least a little bit of entertainment. Anyway, enough about me, let's break this down. Here we are in Cinema 4D. We're gonna start with this hologram only scene. It's less distracting while we talk about the hologram. If there was anything you wanted to see or explore in the main scene, let me know and I'll do a separate video on that. As you can see, it's not overly complicated, just a couple spheres and cloner objects. The magic is in the materials and the espresso animation. A quick note, my layout is a little custom, so things might not always be in the same spot for you, but I will show you a quick and easy way to find almost anything inside of Cinema 4D. In the viewport, if you have the viewport selected, you hit Shift C, a little search menu pops up and you can find almost anything with this. Right away, I wanna show you that I have Bloom on, bokeh post effects on and a bokeh map on my camera so my scene will look a little different than one without these post effects on. Let's start with the base. The base is just a cylinder that I modeled to make look like some image or object could be projected from it. I wanted that old relic sci-fi look like something you might find in an old space junkyard or something. I just have some polygon selections on it to show the three different materials on it. Let me turn off the lights. If you select some polygons and hit store selection, you store those selected polygons in a tag. And from here, you can always come back to that selection if you need it or assign a material to it. If you do have multiple materials on a single object with polygon selections like this, you have to make sure that the materials with the selections are to the right of the main material. If I drag the main material all the way to the right, you can see that it covers up all the other polygon selections. So just remember that your main material always has to be to the left of your other materials. Let's go over the main material real quick, but I'm not gonna spend too much time on it since all the magic happens in the hologram itself and not the base. The main material is really just a blend of two different materials. Our base material is this metallic material with a bump as well. Our second material is this more dirty, damaged metallic material that has a bit of rust and dirt on it. And they are blended together with this material, which is a bunch of curvature and noise nodes multiplied together. This also drives the bump map as well. And together, they create this material. 
If you would like to see more about this material, let me know and I'll do it in a separate video. I just thought it's a little less important than the actual hologram itself. I'm going to go back to my main camera right now. We're going to start talking about the globe now. So let me open up all my globe objects and turn them all back on. This globe is essentially just made up of a bunch of spheres with different materials on them. And then above them, I have all my HUD elements. Let's turn off all the HUD elements for now. I'm also going to turn off all the globe elements except for the base one, and we're going to start with that. This Land 1 RS sphere is the main sphere that everything is based off of. So let's go over to the render view and take a look at it. All it is is just a sphere. The real magic is in the materials, so let's take a look at that. If you aren't used to node style render engines, this material might look a little complex, but it's actually pretty simple and let me explain it. We're going to start with just the diffuse channel. We're going to follow this all the way back to here. This whole material is powered by this image. That image is fed into an RS ramp node that gives it the blue tint. Next, I have it multiplied with a Maxon Noise node to give it a little bit of a glitchy look. That node is pumped through an RS ramp node to control how glitchy I want it to look. These ramp nodes are amazing at controlling levels of detail. Then it is fed to a Vector Multiply node to give it that final diffuse look with that little bit of glitchiness to it. I wanted to make the ocean semi-transparent, so I'm using this image to generate an opacity mask. I then inverted it and used another ramp to control how much opacity is used in the oceans. I wanted to keep a little bit of them to give the sphere a little more curvature and make the sphere look a little more 3D. As I said before, that first image I showed you is used for the fuse, bump, displacement, and also part of the emission. The last part of this material is the city light emissions and the overall emission. This city light emission image is pumped into a ramp to control the brightness, and then another ramp to give it a tint. It's then pumped into a vector add node with the diffuse group that I showed you before that gives it the blue glow and also the orange glow of the cities. And then our final material is what you saw before. You can see the overall technique now. It's mostly emission, opacity maps, ramps, and noise for all these elements. But I wanted to add more detail, so I added another sphere that was just slightly larger than the space sphere. This sphere would be the landmass outline. I wanted it slightly larger so it looks like a HUD element above the landmass. This material is a lot less complex than the main sphere material. It's based around this image of all the continents outlined. It's kind of hard to see right now. It's just a white image with a black outline around the continents. If I invert it, it'll be a little bit easier to see. I sent it to an invert node since you can't tint black. I then sent it into a ramp node to actually tint it. It's then piped into the diffuse and emission channels. I also have it piped into another ramp node and then into the opacity channels, so only the outline is shown. I also have a displacement image. It's the same image as the original sphere, so the outlines follow the same displacement as the main sphere. And with that, we now have more detail with an orange outline around our blue continents. I did the exact same thing with another sphere to outline the countries. It's the exact same technique, but just with a different starting image. This image is piped into another ramp node to give it that tint. This ramp drives the diffuse and emission channels. The original image controls the opacity channel. And with that, we now have an outline around the continents and countries. Next up is the atmospheric glow. This is another sphere that's just slightly larger than the other spheres. In this material, I'm using a Fresnel node to power the whole thing. The Fresnel is piped into the opacity channel to only show the glowing edges. 
It's also piped into a ramp node to tint it, and then into the diffuse and emission channels. This just gives it a little bit of an atmospheric glow, and gives the sphere a little bit more depth. Sometimes these holographic elements look very 2D, this is just to give it a little bit more depth. Our globe is almost done. The last element to the globe is the weather and clouds. Let's turn that object on. It's also just a sphere that's just slightly larger than the atmospheric glow. I'm sure you've picked up by now, but this material is driven by this one image of clouds. It is piped into this ramp node to have more control over how much of the clouds are shown. That ramp node is then piped into the opacity channel to show only the clouds and remove everything else. That ramp is then piped into another ramp to give it a tint. Just like the main continents material, I wanted to give these clouds a little bit of a glitchy look, so I have this max on noise node pumped into this ramp to control how much noise is multiplied onto our clouds image. From here, the clouds and noise are multiplied together to give those clouds that glitchy look that I wanted. This multiply node drives the diffuse and emission channels now. That noise node drives the displacement as well. Our globe is now done. Let's break down all the HUD elements. We're going to start with the flight paths. I wanted it to look like it was a low orbit space travel with a line that indicated altitude. For this, I created five circles that were all larger than the spheres, but had varying sizes. I then put them into a radial cloner with a zero centimeter radius and made the count about 20. I then used a random effector to change the rotation of the circles. This made it look like they were flight paths around the globe. I made a copy of that cloner object, then I did a current state to object and a connect and delete to make a single spline object that we'll need later on. I already have one of these, so I'm just going to delete this one. Back in the cloner, I then made all those circle spline objects into sweep objects with another tiny circle to give them geometry. I wanted them to have dashed lines, so I decided to do this through materials instead of modeling. I used a pinstripe texture I made in Photoshop as the image that drives this whole material. The image was piped into a ramp node that clamps it down a little bit to control how much space is between the dashes. It was also piped into another ramp node to give it a tint. And then finally, that ramp node is piped into the diffuse and emission channels. And now we finally have our dashed line flight path. We have our flight path made. Now we just need icons for whatever kind of crafts we have flying around our globe. These icons are just hexagons in a sweep object with a tiny circle and a text object in the middle. I'm going to turn our globe off so it's easier to see. I have 11 different icons with the same sweep object, but just different text. All of these are inside their own null objects inside the cloner. In this cloner, I have all the icons cloned onto an object. Do you remember that spline object we made before? All the icons are cloned onto that object so they can follow the flight paths we made before. The icons will need to be rotated in the transformation section of the cloner. For the material, it couldn't be more simple. All it is, is just a color in the emission in the diffuse sections. You can choose whatever colors you want, but I chose two different colors, one orange and one blue. We're getting pretty close now. The last geometry elements we need to make are the elevation lines. These are just cylinders with six rotation segments to look like hexagons. The key to preparing these properly is to make one, move the anchor point all the way up to the top and a little bit beyond, and then recenter it. They are cloned onto the same object as the markers with the same count and the same rotation in the transform tab. This way, when the markers move, the cylinders stay in the same relative position as they are now. Let's turn everything back on and take a look at what we have so far. It's looking great so far, but I did have one problem that I had to figure out how to solve. 
I didn't want these cylinders going all the way through the globe, I wanted them to fade as soon as it got to the surface. I didn't want them to be shown beyond the surface of the first sphere. To solve this, I decided to use the X Particles Vertex Map. You could probably do this manually by painting a vertex map with every cylinder, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do it procedurally. I made a copy of the same base sphere we talked about before and used it to help create the vertex map. Inside the XP vertex map object, I added the cylinder cloner. And then inside this layer section with the layer mode set to polygons, I added the sphere we just made. Now if we double click the vertex map we created, we can see that it's working. Because it's calculating it from a cloner, the viewport response will take a big hit, so be aware of that. Now I have the data I need to make the materials for these cylinders. The base material has either an orange or blue color in the emission and the fuse channels. To get the fade that I wanted, I piped the C4D vertex node that was linked to the vertex map we made before into a ramp node so I can control how much they fade. That ramp is then piped into an invert node and then finally piped into the opacity channel. Let me just reconnect that vertex map in the other material as well. And now the cylinders fade as they get closer to the globe. Now we have all our geometry elements in, let's go over lighting next. There are only two lights that are important to the overall hologram concept here. The rest are just general lighting, so I will only touch the two important lights. First, the hologram needs that glowing light source from the device it's being projected from. To do this, I use the spotlight in an RS environment object. I placed the spotlight in the center of the projector and pointed it up. Now if you look at it, we can see fog from the spotlight and the environment object. I then created an image sequence with some color noise moving around in After Effects. I use Red Giant Universe plugins, but you can create something similar natively inside of After Effects. But the overall goal is to have sharper edges between the black and the color areas. Where there is black, the spotlight won't show any light, so it looks more like a laser projector than light and fog. Now back in Cinema 4D, we take that image sequence we made in After Effects and link it to the texture path in the color section of our spotlight. Now if we look at it, it looks more like a projection and not just gray fog. I then adjusted the environment object and the spotlight intensity until I got a look I liked. The last light I needed to help sell this was a light that created reflections and spill from the hologram on the surface and back onto the projector. To do this, I used a point light inside of the globe. This point light has a material on it. In this material, I have a blurry version of the same sequence inside of the spotlight. With this, it looks like the hologram is actually illuminating the area around it. Now we have a finished hologram. You could render this as a still image, but I wanted to animate mine, and not just any animation either. To help sell the idea that this is a relic or an older style hologram projector, I wanted the animation to be sticky. I didn't want it to be smooth, but I wanted it to be more like the way a second hand moves on a clock. Do people still have clocks with second hands? Do people still have clocks in general? I don't even know. To accomplish this, I used Espresso. Let me walk you through it. The goal was to move the offset slider in the cloner objects, but not move them continuously. I wanted them to move just a little bit at specific times, which is why I did it through Espresso and not keyframing it. One thing we need to know is that the offset slider is in percentages. That will be important later on. In the Espresso window, we start off with time. Actually, let me jump to one second so this makes sense. This time node is in seconds and not frames. That's important to know as well. After each node, I have a result node so you can see what's happening. Next, we have a math node set to multiply the time, which is in seconds, by 0.02. I'll put this here for now. Uh, when I actually play it, I'll move it out of the way. If I plug this directly into our offset values, they will continuously move at 2% each second which is a great way to control how fast they move, but they still move continuously. To change that, we need a node called a universal node. 
This node can change our numbers from real numbers, which have decimal points, to integers, which are only whole numbers. But as you can see, our current values are nowhere near whole numbers. They are still decimal points only because of the math node in the beginning. So before we place the universal node, we need to multiply our current values by 100, so they're in the real number range. And to get them back to decimal values of percentages, we divide them by 100 before sending them to the offset value. And the final nodes in this espresso chain are the offset values of the two cloners. A quick tip, you can drag any parameter from the attributes manager into an espresso node. Now, if we watch the playback, we see that the value after the universal node only changes after a whole number is reached, and that the decimal value is not shown after the universal node. So essentially, the offset doesn't change until a new integer is reached. This causes the markers to move only at specific times during playback, and that is every 15 frames in this case. Let's take a look at it now in the viewport. We see we get that stuck, jittery animation that I was looking for instead of a smooth, continuous animation. Like it's being updated every half second and not constantly updated. My cloud sphere is animated in a similar way. I have the time multiplied by two. This node controls how far the clouds rotate each time they rotate. And it's piped into a universal node, making it an integer again which is then piped into a degree node that changes it from degrees to radians, which is how Expresso handles rotation. So every 15 frames or half a second, it rotates one degree. If you need more control of how far the offset was on the marker animation or how far each rotation of the clouds were, you would need to add more math nodes after the universal node. The reason both animations happen every 15 frames or half a second is because that first multiplier takes half seconds or 0.5 seconds and doubles it to make it a new integer every 15 frames or every half second. So for example, say you want the animation to happen every second but still move just as much, you change the first multiplier to 0.01 on the markers or 1 for the clouds, and then you add a multiplier right before the result of 2 on both of them. Now you get an animation every second that moves just as far as it did every half second. Now the animation moves every 30 frames or one second, and it moves as much as it did when it was only 15 frames and half a second. And with that, we broke down all the elements that make up this hologram animation. Everything you saw in the main scene was just set dressing or used similar concepts to what you saw here. If you want to see more of the scene, let me know, and in future videos, I will break down the whole scene besides just the star of the show. Thank you for watching. I hope you were able to find something useful out of this. If you need any more details about any techniques or elements used here, please let me know, and I'll do my best to answer them. If you did find this useful, please consider liking the video, commenting, and maybe even subscribing. I do plan to do a couple more scene breakdowns in the near future, but I also have a lot more planned as well. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time on Sorta Like This.